Thank you, Lars. Thank you very much for this uh, energetic and kind introduction. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to my presentation. So let's see if we can see the screen. OK, I will go talk about sensor data fusion more in a very general way um, in terms of what it is, what we're working on, and also um, uh, what the history of data fusion is, and especially, of course, what I think where data fusion is going to um, in terms of the applications and also the methodologies. So data fusion has come um, originally, so uh, as, as we see it from the JDL group, the Joint Laboratories of Data Fusion, um, from 1987, so almost 30 years ago. And um, they, this group of uh, pioneers has come up with a first really schematic way and organized way to, uh, to, to define the hierarchies of data fusion, to extract higher level information and higher meanings of data in terms of a hierarchy. So even though this model is so old, people are still using it, and it's still very important. So the, the levels defined back these days um, are still applied. And I think it's, it's important to know the roots of, of data fusion, uh, why it has become uh, come up in this structure, and uh, to overcome this structure, and also to benefit from the structure both. So to know the structure is very important to um, apply the existing methodologies because they refer to a certain assumptions. And to provide new methodologies, it's important to overcome the structure in order to do some cross-layer processing. And that's also um, yeah, some cross-reference to where data fusion is going nowadays. Uh, let's just have a, a short look at the model. It's, um, I, I won't go too much into the details of this, but this, uh, that you have seen the model. Something is happening here on the right side in the, in the real world. So this is the real world happening here, some events happening. Um, we are measuring these events in terms of sensors. Uh, so we have some, some uh, signals measured here in terms of uh, some of these sensors or other sensors might be imagined. And then um, the information level is going up in this direction. And here we have the user, the operator, um, who has to yeah, work with the information and has to make decisions. And we want to support the operator to make optimal decisions. So at level zero, we really do uh, signal processing and uh, refinement of the actual data. And then at level one, we extract uh, some, some terms of um, hidden variables, so already some, some states which we can't measure directly. In situation um, refinement, we look for the whole picture. So we have multiple objects. Do they interact um, and, and so on? And, and level three also uh, implies the assessment of impacts and also um, yeah, history of, of the situation. So scans in multiple times and, and history and prediction in, in the future. Um, and of course, we also have a context into information which can be fused. So that was 1987 and still apply today. But of course, if we want to improve some, for some uh, certain methodologies, nowadays people are working on cross-layer fusion. Let's say we, we work on the raw data from the signal and uh, already process them into hidden variable states. That's already cross-layer um, processing as an example. So here's a short overview of um, what I see data fusion today. We have lots of uh, multiple algorithms and approaches in the methodology. Here is just to name a few. I, I can't go into the details of, of all of them, but it's it's just uh, yeah, and not, yeah, it's just a, sh a list of um, well-known methods how you can process data and track objects and fuse data over time. So either fuse data over multiple instances of time or from multiple sensors or both, of course. And depending on the scenario, uh, you would have to choose the optimal algorithm, which obviously is not easy as long as you, you're not really aware of what is else, what else can be found in the literature. So one 
trend in methodology in data fusion is sort of to unify those methodologies. What is, what is the higher level um, approach? What is the, the, the structure behind those methods so that you can model your problem in a higher level and then derive the, the filtering, the um, data fusion algorithm from uh, this higher level prescription? So in the security and defense applications, you will find most of the um, fusion um, applications. That's maybe also due to the history. Data fusion has especially uh, built, be built, was especially built for radar processing and tracking of objects in, in air surveillance. Um, but of course, the applications have become much broader, but still are very focused on security and surveillance applications. Um, of course, nowadays, um, automotive and robotics also play an important role, um, although uh, they have uh, more specific assumptions in some way. Uh, um, um, yeah, um, These are uh, very emerging technologies, and, and they, are, um, uh, they are progressing, and uh, it's, it's becoming more and more from, from this side. So um, I would like to show you some applications we have been working on and we are currently working on these days. Um, so uh, that you see the, the means of what data fusion can do. Um, here is an, I think, very nice example. That's passive coherent location, also known as passive radar. So the situation is we have certain um, GSM base stations or other uh, cell phone base stations everywhere around the world and we want to use the signal broadcasted from these stations to track objects passively. So we have here, we have a, a small vessel, um, might be very fast and, and also passive, so it's not emitting any signal. And we want to track this, uh, this vessel to know where its position is, where it, what its velocity, where it's heading to. And we are using the broadcast signal and then we, we here receive with our system the direct signal as well as the reflection from the vessel. And that's called passive coherent localization. And it works so well because you find these base stations all over the world and um, you don't need any licenses for broadcasting a radar signal. And of course, you, you spare a lot of energy because you're just using um, the signal, which is anyways in the air. And we have do, done some experiment for harbor protection and I, I will um, show you a, sh a short video. of the result. The problem here is that the problem is highly nonlinear. So you're measuring a, a bi-static um, range and a Doppler measurement, of course. Um, this should look. Ah, looks better. <laughs> OK. So here we have um, a vessel going uh, a, a trajectory. We have also the ground truth by this uh, white indicator and the green one is the track we established. Here is our antenna and, and this is the, the harbor area. And um, yeah, we're using the, the base stations which are um, located here along the coast. And we can see that um, this vessel is, is followed uh, quite precisely even though um, yeah, we are not using active radar. So it's very interesting for um, for, for our, uh, harbor protection. You can see that you can follow the trajectory quite precisely. And this is a nice example for data fusion because the, um, the parameters you're interested in, here it's um, the, the position and the velocity, is, is a, a very uh, indirect parameter in terms of the data you're obtaining. So you're obtaining um, the bi-static range. So that's the range from um, so the, you, can, you can take the difference from a, a transmitter, GSM base stations, to your antenna, and then you take the, the other route is the reflection of the object. And from this information, you have to extract the position, and you need uh, data fusion in order to come up with a um, precise result. Another applica uh, application is, of course, the fusion of multiple um, the fusion of multiple information from, from multiple uh, sources. So the next example I will show you is the fusion 
of um, yeah of a bearing uh, of a radio frequency bearing emitter uh, sensor based on on, um, on on a small airplane, uh, which is then fused with an electro optical camera, which can classify cars in a picture. So we have two sources. Um, we have an array which gives you a bearing of an emitter signal. Um, you can see at the ground, and then this uh, information is fused with the classifier of an electro-optical camera, which looks for cars. It might have some false detections, as you can see here, but it might also have some true detections. And uh, the, the bearing itself is quite inaccurate, just uh, yeah, because you have a, a very small array on, on such an airplane. Um, but Fusing this bearing with a classifier, which gives you um, the position or the angle in terms of pixels, uh, the angle of, of a car you're looking for will make the position very precise. And that's also a good example because you improve um, your estimate of the parameters um, in, in terms of fusion of multiple sensors. So that's a schematic view in uh, a world wine. Um, this is the airplane. The trajectory is uh, put in into um, the, the data of the airplane is put into the visualization. But this is this data from a real field experiment. The yellow cone is uh, the field of view of the array antenna, which gives you bearings um, of the emitter. And the blue square is the picture. And actually, the quality is now quite bad. But um, yeah, you would see the, the original picture of the, of the camera. And uh, yeah, you can see that it fits uh, well to, um, to the yeah, mapped, map information in here. And then um, the information is fused. And we improve the estimate um, by combining both information. So here we see some, some red lines, which gives you the, R, the radio frequency bearing, and the green lines are the results of the um, electro-optical classifications. Okay, third and last example is um, an interesting security ap application. And um, this is interesting because we do uh, tracking and classification simultaneously. So in this example, it, the goal is to uh, detect hazardous material in terms of, so let's say, explosives a person is carrying. And uh, those persons are walking through uh, the system here, through that uh, tunnel. And in this tunnel, we have mounted some sensors. We have um, those uh, square, those L square sensors are laser scanners, which give you uh, a range and a bearing uh, in a very precise manner. So we have a, a point cloud from the persons. Um, so we can, can detect where the persons are walking. We fuse those. Uh, point clouds in order to to establish um, to estimate w um, where are the persons and which trajectories are those persons going. And then we have some chemical sensors. These are the C points in here, and the chemical sensors are smelling for explosives. So if a person is carrying an explosive, chemical um, sensors will give you an alarm rate. But the chemical sensors have a very bad spatial temporal resolution. So we will have um, the, the alarm quite uh, with a delay after the person has passed this spot. And by means of data fusion, you can still um, see which person is carrying the explosive. 
So I'm sorry, the switching takes always a little bit of time, so a bit tedious, but we will have it done. Okay, so time is passing now, and you will see persons entering. These are just some false detections of the laser scanners. Um, this is the detection rate of the chemical for chemical sensors. Now, persons carry, um, which uh, don't carry, you can see here, by the way, the, the pictures of the, the persons, and uh, they are moving in a quite unordered way, so we're not really assuming that they, they walk um, right one behind the other. Um, they can move quite arbitrarily. And uh, by means of the point clouds here, um, we detect that there's a person, the extent of the person, and yeah, it's called extended object tracking, um, where the persons are yeah, approximated by an ellipse. And now we have seen that some, some uh, chemical sensors uh, show, show um, a little bit of an alarm rate, but uh, not really, really high. So we had, yeah, I, pers I have missed it. Let's go back a little. Okay, so here, now this person, which goes quite fast, has indicated, has made uh, those chemical sensors to indicate that there, there is something. And even though we have now quite a number of persons involved, we were able um, to, to detect that this is the person who carries the explosives, it's now indicated by the red, uh, by the red corona here. And we have presented this also in a, in a real demonstration um, with uh, uh, thousands of people involved and it works quite reliable. And uh, this is now um, nowadays also extended to, um, to uh, dirty bombs where we work with gamma ray detection sensors. So I think this is a quite uh, interesting example that you can also uh, fuse for classification um, issues. So, so you do tracking, data tracking uh, of objects, and, and while you do this, you classify them into certain classes, and uh, you can do this to detect uh, the threat in this case. Okay. So these are current applications we have been working on, but. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the future, and the concept of data fusion is very, very general. So you can really uh, apply to many applications, especially, of course, whenever you have hidden variables and, and higher levels of information you're interested in, and you have a, a, a wide, quite um, raw data available. So the few applications I would see in the future um, are not focused only on security and surveillance, of course, we already see a lot of uh, data fusion and tracking uh, being done in automotive applications. Of course, um, advanced driver systems are, are set up everywhere in the automotive industry and self-driving cars. Um, then, but also Internet of Things is uh, also uh, an important topic where a lot of small uh, devices are connected to each other and they often carry some sort of sensors and provide information and data about the environment. So um, here I think there's a lot of potential for data fusion um, methodologies for the future. Energy is um, yeah, something I, I wrote here also because we have some first uh, discussions with energy partners, so especially um, yeah, the, the example I can provide is we have um, a partner which does solar energy and they want to track the beams of a solar panel um, which can be really improved by data fusion. Um, big data is very, uh, in a, in a very a big community too, of course, uh, but still um, uh, I think the, the Bayesian approach really could ha also help uh, to estimate variables um, which you are interested in here in big data and uh, yeah, the, the two communities can, um, can profit from each other. Healthcare is a, a, a big market and so there might be some very interesting applications here because also the patient of the future has a lot of sensors involved. So a lot of sensors 
are measuring um, the, the uh, properties of the human body now already in the hospitals, but nowadays you can also find a lot of uh, apps in the app stores for your cell phone to, to measure your blood pressure, to your uh, heart rate, and so on. So also here these methodologies can provide um, uh, yeah, improvements. Yeah, and of course, yeah, these are, are also um, applications where you work with a lot of data. Won't go too into much too much into detail, but of course, these are, are very uh, emerging fields which which have um, lots of applications in the future. So the last part of the talk, I would like to spend uh, to show you some some novel uh, yeah approaches in Bayesian filtering. So originally, uh, most um, filters have been working with either Gaussian approximations, so we, we assume the world is Gaussian, we can uh, work with first and second moments of, of a probability density function, which uh, especially approximates in the situation in terms of a mean, uh, the most likely state, and a covariance, which gives you the, an indicator of how exact is your mean. And then a recursive data processing has been set up, to propagate the means and, and, the, and the covariances and uh, to, to fuse information and uh, yeah, compute the, the new parameters of such a filter. The second approach you can see in, in the literature is the particle-based uh, approach where you, you put up samples which, is which are distributed according to a, 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 um, uh, the, the, the distribution of, of the real world. So. Um, these particles uh, provide uh, some samples, and in terms of the samples, you can predict um, the the, uh, the samples and update the samples with the Bayesian approach. But um, both both of those methodologies have uh, limitations based on their assumption. So here it's a Gaussian assumption. When your problem is not Gaussian, then um, yeah, you will have a problem. You will need an approximation. And also you need a, a, a so-called linearization. So if the state transition between the actual measurement you're taking and the state you're interested in is a nonlinear connection, then you would have to linearize this function um, in order to make those, uh, those uh, methods work. In, in, for many applications, this works fine. So linear, linearization is good approximation in many applications. But of course, in high nonlinear applications, this is a severe problem, and you will find you have to use different methods. The problem on the particle filters is um, particularly curse of dimensionality. So if you have a high-dimensional state, let's say 10-dimensional um, state, so you have 10 parameters which are connected to each other and which you are interested in, you want to estimate them with samples, then you have a 10-dimensional state. And if you try to approximate a 10-dimensional state with, with uh, particles, with, with um, samples, you will need lots of them. And this will give you um, computational limitations on, on the precision you can achieve. And also a known problem with this is a weight degeneration. I won't go too much into detail of this, but uh, depending on the quality of your sensor, um, the weights might gener degenerate because um, the, the computers are not uh, able to, um, to really represent numbers which are very, very small below, be above zero. So it will uh, make them zero and then uh, you have this weight degeneration. Um, the novel technique here for nonlinear filtering is based on the Fokker-Planck equation. So the Fokker-Planck equation is the underlying differential equation to describe a stochastical process. So here you see the picture of um, a diffusion and um, the, the, the movement of the mean. So the mean is moving here, and while the mean is moving, the covariance is getting broader. The PDF um, has a diffusion over here. And this is the same equation as you can find in many physical problems. It's the Fokker-Planck equation. So the time evolution of this probability density function is described by the Fokker-Planck equation. And the new approach here is to solve the Fokker-Planck equation based on tensors. Um, because I mentioned tensors, I will come back, to back, 
back, I will come back to the slide uh, previously. I would just uh, uh, would like to, to show you the, the approach of the tensors. The tensor representation can be um, decomposed in some of Kronecker products. Here's how it works simply in, in a, a two-dimensional problem. If you have a data matrix Y, which represents the, the information you have, you can present this as an outer product of vectors. For matrices, this is known as a so-called singular value decomposition. But of course, often our world is not two-dimensional, so we have to find something more general. And the more general approach is a rank one decomposition or parafact decomposition. There are many, many names in the literature. This is kind of a generaliz generalization of this approach to, to arbitrary dimensions. So here, this picture gives you an idea how it works in three dimensions. In terms of formulas, it looks like this. You have a sum over multiple components, and then you have the outer product of some loading vectors, indicated here in different colors. And this is a very efficient way to represent your data, and I strongly recommend you to consider this, if this is applicable to maybe your problem, because um, we have found that this uh, can provide very efficient solutions. Um, if you have represented your data, in, in terms of a tensor decomposition, then you do the standard um, Bayesian prediction and filtering. So in the prediction, you let time pass. In other words, you solve the Fokker-Planck equation for the tensor decomposed uh, PDF. And after you have done this, it's, it's well possible. Then you do the filtering by means of the Bayes formula, which is more or less a pointwise uh, multiplication and normalization afterwards. Um, in this case, this is the, the more uh, computational uh, complexity operation and the Bayesian filtering is, is quite fast. But I don't uh, want to steer you this slide. This is another approach um, to, to uh, solve nonlinear estimation. This is called homotopy filters. Homotopy filters uh, try to avoid the weight degeneration uh, by letting the particles flow. So in standard particle filters, weights are re-weighted, and then you have this, um, this degeneration problem that the weight might get zero. Even in theory, it's, it's not really zero. Um, the key idea here is to flow the particles and model it as a physical flow. So also, again, you have the Fokker-Planck equation um, involved here, but now uh, an imaginary time has been involved, uh, is involved um, to move the particles to the posterior. Okay. Now this is um, an example of a bi-static 4D radar tracking. Um, so the state space is four-dimensional. Here we have just uh, plotted the two-dimensional state. And in the beginning, you can see this very non-Gaussian noise here. So this is this uh, banana-shaped form is, is very non-Gaussian. The measurement function is nonlinear, and then you can see that the estimate becomes quite accurate in quite soon after a few measurements. So here, the sensor is at the, the left corner. It's, um, it's two receivers and one transmitter of a radar system. And this will give, bring, bring me almost to the end. Um, the, um, the conclusion is, yeah, we uh, still use the original model from eight, 1987. Um, so uh, we have data fusion in various applications now and uh, probably in the future. And uh, I've shown you some, some trends. Of course, it's, it's um, uh, a subjective, it's, it's, it's a very personal uh, um, view on, on what I, I think is, is important and what are the current trends which would we give uh, a lot of attention in the future, but uh, these methodologies I've shown you um, are, are playing a key role nowadays in the, in the um, research community. Um, I've not spoken so much about generalizing approaches um, because yeah, that would be too much for today, but people are also working on generalizing these uh, different methodologies to, to get a more general uh, description of data fusion and uh, yeah, as I th said, a promising example of a particular method is the Fokker-Planck-based estimation. Here is just a little hint that my, my boss, Wolfgang Koch, wrote a book which is very 
uh, valuable for data fusion and tracking if you're interested in that. And last but not least, uh, our annual workshop next year again, please feel free and uh, yeah, I would invite you to submit a paper to our conference in Bonn. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Felix Rovas.